I wanted to take a quick minute to talk about our, one of our sponsors that make this podcast possible, and that's Parker Sporlin and the Catch-All Filter Dryer. Do you know what can reduce system efficiencies and reliability within your refrigeration system? If you answer contamination, you are correct. Sporlin Catch-All Dryers have been around, been around since 1947 and have been perfected over the years to capture water, acid, solids, debris, including sludges and varnishes. For best practices, change the catch-all filter dryer if any of the following occurs. Initial system install, when a system is open for service or repair, when excessive pressure drop of 5 PSI across the filter dryer, when the see-all sight glass indicates water is present, when doing a T1-1 acid test kit says there's acid present, during a compressor burnout cleanup, and following a successful burnout cleanup. To find out more information, by downloading Bulletin 40-10 from Sporlin.com with all the catch-all filter dryer information. Thanks, guys. Enjoy the episode. We've all been there, in the middle of a job, everything going smoothly, until boom, you're missing a part. United Refrigeration is your one-stop shop for all your refrigeration needs. Use your computer or smartphone to go to www.uri.com at any time of the day or night to check stock on your favorite brands, such as Copeland, Sporlin, Carlisle Compressors, Danfoss, Emerson CPC Boards and Sensors, Corel, Husman Parts, and Ketotherm. United Refrigeration Inc. is home to these brands and many more. Looking for information on refrigerant conversions or refrigerant banking? Quick access links on the homepage can get you to the information you need. All approved accounts are able to see live to the minute inventory and pricing. Product not in stock at your local branch? No problem. Use the nearby stock feature to find a local branch that does have what you need. Are you looking for a branch address, phone number, or after hours number? That's all available as well. Just click on the branch locator and search for your local branch. Have a model number and looking for a replacement part? www.uri.com forward slash ARP has a vast list of quick pick replacement parts. Just search for the model number of the equipment you're working on and click the replacement parts tab. If you don't have an account, Click the register button and we'll have you online in no time. With more than 400 locations in North America, each United Refrigeration branch is fully stocked for immediate pickup. Our branch employees have in-depth technical knowledge so we can help you get what you need when you need it. Visit your local store or www.uri.com forward slash ARP today. United Refrigeration Inc has all your solutions down cold. Hmm. Peter, no! I'm gonna put this in there. Don't do that! You think this is a bad idea? Yes, it's a bad idea! I'm getting mixed signals. Yes or no? It's a definite no! I can't see your mouth through the gate. No, 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 no! I think you said yes. No! I'm going with yes. <laughs> To advanced refrigeration podcast you're here with your host brett wetzel and kevin compass what's going on in your week of the world over there man oh well this is the beginning of the week so it's the beginning of the cluster um yeah start off the week just doing a co2 startup help helping one of my other guys get everything run, running and uh, charged up and then uh i'm actually running service this week because we are out of construction work right now because right. Nobody can deliver cases on time. Are we? Are you guys all done with the uh, the 
uh, three racks to one rack or whatever. Yeah, so that that I think we finished that last Thursday, and now we are uh, basically waiting and uh, you know praying and hoping that uh, Husband actually delivers cases and racks because uh, we are out of cases at like almost every job. Sweet. So nothing to start up. So I am on service the rest of the week. So cool beans. It, it has been a treat so far. Uh, last week I was uh, down in Houston doing some video recording. Uh, making some training videos. Uh, so this week is, you know, getting caught up on stuff that I wasn't able to do when I was, in, you know, in town, uh, conference calls and all the other fun stuff, uh, getting ready to revamp the, uh, the training program, you know, getting that thing uh, lit off. And um, so things are going to start getting busy real quick. But um, tonight, training. we're uh, what's that? I said training. What's that? <laughs> So uh, this week we're um, we're going to be talking about uh, pressure controls, um, anything from high pressure controls to uh, fan cycling switches, high pressure switches, you know, wh- whatever we, whatever we want to cover. Um, to start, what did what did you want to hit on first? Um, be it that it's uh, it's you know in the winter realm. Do you want to start talking about uh, fan cycling controls uh, as it pertains to like single systems? Yeah, I guess we can. So, like, guys, what I, what I wanted to do more so is just break down uh, some easier ways to troubleshoot uh, pressure controls and how to set them up and deal with them. So <clears throat> this is more geared towards a, new, a greener guy apprentice and uh, you know, some inter- intermediate guys and some t- tips and tricks along the way. So we can start with fan cycling controls. So a fan cycling control is a, is a close on rise pressure control. So, it is going to close when the pressure increases. It's going to close that contact. So fan cycling controls are used for head pressure control, um, controlling your capacity or condenser. You know, 90% of the time it's for head pressure control. It could be used for on an ice machine for defrost to build up pressure during defrost of the ice machine. Fan cycle controls could also be used for... Uh, evaporator fans not very often you see this on some larger like hot gas equipment you'll see it but it's not very common but that is what a fan cycling control will be used for it's going to be used for it's a it's a close on rise so when the pressure increases it's going to um close the switch generally you see like a 50 pound differential it it depends what you're trying to maintain like 50 pounds is really is, is a lot of swing though. I mean, I try to like get generally get them like 25, 30 pounds, as long as you're not banging it on and off constantly. Uh, big thing with fan cycle controls is make sure you're actually looking at the actual control and what it can actually handle because you start throwing a three quarter horse or a quarter horse motor on there. It's not going to last long if it even lasts at all. And then, uh, Go ahead, Brett. It's all. It also goes off the manufacturer, um, right? They're gonna the manufacturer is gonna put uh, equipment in there, you know, you know, sized and controlled, you know, basically how it how it's supposed to be. Um, you know, you're not gonna you know short cycle, you know, the holy hell out of a a one horsepower thousands of times. So you know, if it didn't come with fan cycling switch originally, uh, it was intended to run without. Um, so well, I go that far because let, let let's be honest here. I mean, how much equipment comes out built wrong or designed yeah. wrong? No, so I, I mean, agree. But like, as far as the you know the basic theory, right? You know, we're trying to control the the best saturated condensing temperature, the be- the best evaporator temp, uh, you know, temperature based off of pressure. You know, it, you know, with the controls that we have, you know, as close as humanly possible. Like you said, the 20, 20 pound swing on fan cycling controls, you know, is typically what I do. So if we're you know if we're set for one hundred and forty eight on our holdback valve. 128 on our receiver repressurization valve then that means i probably wouldn't kick my fan my first fan on until that head pressure got you know somewhere in the wheelhouse of like 168 pounds and that's basically just to reduce the amount of uh short cycling and then any adjacent fans you know above that you know basically you could you know go five or ten pounds heavier you know on that control so basically you're not you know you're not overlapping right and you're you're cycling the right fans on when you're supposed to um what i meant by that is you know like on the bone evaporators right you know typically if it's a two fan evaporator they typically have one 
fan on a ambient thermostat, which typically shuts off that one, that first fan if we're at 60 degrees or, or below. And, you know, it doesn't typically have a fan cycling control. So if you were to go and throw a fan cycling control on, you know, on that, try to maintain a little bit tighter of a head pressure uh, for all intents and purposes, you know, we could end up short cycling the hell out of that condenser fan motor and then in fact, you know, taking it out, you know? Yeah. I mean, fan cycling is not the best option, obviously, but uh, if some, in some cases it's the only option. Um. I want to go into low pressure controls now. This is where like the meat and potatoes, are, like where I want to spend the majority of the time at. So low pressure controls, um, use in all kinds of applications for single units. They're used for the basically your compressor operation and temperature control. Use it as a is a pump down device, temperature control. Your rack application, it is uh, our a backup safety. It's not our operating control ninety percent of the time, but it is a backup safety. And uh, this is something I kind of want to talk about. Uh, guys, check low pressure controls, uh, especially on PMs. Make sure they're set. Make sure there's not an issue. I see this all the time at Walmarts. Like guys jump out like time delays. And jumping out time delays like Walmart is a bad idea. Unless you absolutely do not have one or, I mean, it's the middle of the night. Because if that low pressure control goes to cut out that rack and that time delay jumped out, that thing's going to stay running and then you're going to pull into a vacuum and just tell you a little story. We had a couple stores out here that that happened at, they had a leak in the underground, small suction leak in the underground. They pulled in a ton of moisture and it, it has become a nightmare for service. So, I mean, and it was something as simple as a jumped out time delay or a bad low pressure control or a low pressure control that didn't shut the rack down. So that is why, making sure those low pressure controls and like time delays aren't jumped out are incredibly important. So, I mean, just take the time and actually check them. So I'm, we're going to go over this and how I check them and how we set them and all that stuff. So first things first, if I'm replacing a low pressure control or a high pressure control or any pressure control, whether it's fan cycling switch, I do it at my truck. I set it at my truck. So I get a tank of nitrogen, a tank of CO2, something. I'll hook a smart probe up to it. Um, I like my uh, cheap Chinese knockoff or my Appian with a screen on it. Stick a smart probe on there. You could do a gauge. You could do whatever. And then what I will do is I will put it on a core puller. And I put the gauge on the side of the core puller where your micron gauge would go. I put the, the bottom of the core puller where you would pull a straighter out. I put that on the pressure control. And then on the side where you would normally hook a hose up to to recover from or pull a vacuum, I hook the, the nitrogen and CO2 up there and I get the pressure down as low as I can with the regulator or whatever I'm doing. And I will pressurize that pressure control and try to um, make it, if it's a low pressure control and say I'm trying to maintain a 50 pound cut in, I will pressurize it to 50 pounds. Okay, exactly. I will dial that control in to where it cuts in exactly 50 pounds. Now, I'm watching this with my meter hooked up to it on ohms. So I have my meter on ohms and I have it on the terminals with alligator clips or whatever. I, I have uh, the fluke alligator grabbers. And then I will reduce the pressure in that pressure control. And I to what it, say if I wanted to kick out at 20 pounds, I'll reduce that pressure down to 20 pounds. Then I'll adjust the control to cut out at 20 pounds. So I will set this control in my truck for a couple of reasons. It's way easier than trying to do it on the roof. I know it works then. <clears throat> I still test it when I get it in the equipment because it could be a wiring issue. Somebody could have jumped something out down the line. But I'm at least testing it just to make sure it shuts off. I don't care what it shuts off at really because I already know that it's set and ready to go in my truck. Same thing with high pressure controls. Say if I got to set it to 500 pounds, I'll get it close. I will I will bench test it at 500 pounds and I will bring it out to the field. Fan cycling controls, same thing. If I'm trying to set up fan cycling control, I don't try to do it on the unit. It's a pain in the ass. It takes forever. You got to sit there, wait for it to build up, then go down and build up, then go down. I will literally set it with a nitrogen tank or a CO2 tank in my van. It's way easier. It takes five minutes of your time to do it in the beginning to save 30 minutes later on. You know, in the middle of the night, everybody wants to get out of there. 
I mean, why not just do it in your truck and have it ready to go? Um, I don't know how many times I'm sure you've done this where basically you tried to set a pressure control while it was in there and you probably spent 30, 45 minutes, you know, just trying to figure out, okay, how do I pump this down? All right, well, I'm going to shut this down. Well, it's going to take 20 or 30 minutes, you know, for you to, to get all set up and, and have it right where you're, where you're at. Otherwise you're just, you're, you're, you're basically just pissing in the wind. So the way that you do it is the exact same way I do it. It just, it makes it so much easier. Plus I, I you know, uh, I will, I don't know. I'll give you money for the lottery if you can tell me that you've had this happen. But you know, basically have it where you set a pressure control just basically off of the off of the numbers and the and you know the the slashes on there. How many times you had it exactly? Yeah, one, one from the nineties, maybe when it was actually made like you know good in in the U.S. Not none of these cheap Chinese junk uh, like pressure controls we have now. Like I I, I don't know how many. Uh, of the black pen ones that like are just like way off. Like I set one this morning that was like 40 pounds off from a dial. So setting, setting the way that you were talking about is just, it's so much easier. Um, you know, they will use uh, pressure controls in, in a non-conventional uh, way as well. Um, you know, years ago they used to make a lot of these time clocks where they actually had a built-in pressure control uh, for the termination. And the idea was, is, you know, on single systems that do not have a receiver, um, basically, you know, the temperature pressure relationship is what they're, you know, basically utilizing to make sure that that unit actually went into a defrost. So if, you know, if termination temperature needs to be 48 degrees, you would find the saturated, whatever refrigerant that you're running and set that pressure control, um, you know, accordingly. And, you know, typically you never want to do this on a pump down system. Um, so just be mindful of that. Also, since we are talking about pressure controls, um, the way that they're drawn is going to give you a lot of indication of how they're actually functioning. And I'll, I'll put some examples of, you know, high pressure switches, you know, cause it basically, if you look at a low pressure switch and a fan cycling switch, you know, they're basically both doing the same thing. They're both uh, opening up on a low, if you really think about it, right. And closing and closing on a high, you know, we're just ones on the high side, ones on the low side. Yeah. I mean, one other thing I want to go over. So if you guys are checking pressure controls, especially low pressure controls, and you are checking them on a rack, um, look at the wiring diagram. If it's a Hussman rack, generally it's probably going to have what's called switchback in it, meaning switchback's an old school term from Hussman. They basically bypass the low pressure controls, which is, I think, the best solution out there, when, especially you're doing rack controls, because now the low pressure control is not in the safety circuit per se, to cause issues with the EMS because I see this a lot. I see the pressure control fighting the EMS and that's not what we want. The pressure control should be there for a backup. The low pressure should. So what Husband does is on these racks, they use switchback control. So what happens is the switchback relay is normally open generally and the controller commands it to be closed and it closes the relay and allows voltage to bypass the low pressure control around the safety circuit so that way that the low pressure control is always made because it has a bypass relay around it this is a good idea because now it's not going to be interfering with the ems control you don't have guys like messing up pressure control settings or trying to set things the way they want in order to make a pressure cycle so when you're checking these you have to kill the switchback relay so say if you are testing low pressure controls and you're testing them on a pm you have to kill the switchback relay and allow switchback to take over control of the rack. So that way you could actually make the low pressure control shut the compressors off. So that's just one thing. And if it's the Hill Phoenix way of doing it, where you have one, generally that low main low pressure control, like at a Walmart or something is breaking the time delay power on the, uh, for the time delays. And it really matters where you have these wired in because it depends. Some of the older vintage racks, they also broke uh, one leg of the time delay power with the phase monitor. So if you jump out of time delay, you better make sure that it's not also uh, the, the phase monitor protection too. Um, generally, you see that on some older racks, newer stuff, they don't do that. I think they learned a lesson from guys jumping out time delays and burning up pumps when, for phase loss. But just keep that in mind with the Hill Phoenix style where you have one one time to one low pressure control for the whole rack. So you want to set that at the, at the lowest possible setting. So like say, 
say you're uh, you're trying to maintain an 18 degree saturated te- saturation temp with the compressor for, with the with the rack. Okay, I would set that probably about 12 degrees with the low pressure control. So you want to set it lower than the EMS is going to hit. You guys got to remember if it's a Walmart, Novar's got a little bit of lag time. It's like a minute and a half to two minute stage down. So give yourself some wiggle room there. Um, you want to set low enough where it's not going to fight the EMS. And then what you're going to do is you're going to set your time delays. I generally go two, two minute and two minute stages. If I have a really big pump and it's the last pump, it's probably going to be like five minutes. So your whole goal here is to, if that, if that rack hits that low pressure, it's going to shut all the pumps off. Okay. And then when it finally stages back up and makes, it's going to bring on the first pump. You know, it's going to make it bring on the first pump after, after so many minutes, it's going to bring on the next pump. And if it still isn't satisfied, it's going to bring on the next pump and it's going to keep doing that. And then it's going to shut back off. So it goes through the staging cycle, not the best solution, but it's temporary. If the EMS is down, it'll get you through at night. That's why you need to make sure that that pressure control is set properly in your time delays. Um, second of off, if the controller was to like reboot, I see this all the time. If your time delays are not set, you will bang on and off the low pressure control on the Hill Phoenix racks and the EMS will never take back over control because it's just constantly banging on and off and it cannot uh, unwind the PID of the suction group to catch up with it. So make sure that pressure control is set properly and make sure your time delays actually have some staging in there because you don't want, say, after a power outage, everything to come on and a low pressure switch to make and then boom, all your compressors are on. You're going to blow a main especially if you're having voltage fluctuations. So make sure those time delays are actually set. They are critical. Um, with Husman, same thing. The time delays, if they are there, may be out of the safety circuit uh, in switchback, when switchback is not active. When switchback is active and the low pressure controls are inside, the, inside of the safety circuit, then you could test your low pressure controls and your time delays. So just... Be aware of that when you're doing PMs to actually look at that stuff and uh, take the time to kill the switch back. I usually just pull the the relay out of the control board or flip the HOA switch if I have that. That way I could actually test the low pressure controls. Um, generally, if I'm doing them on a compressor, I will do them. I will just start to valve off the compressor and start to let it run in a vac. Like let it run till it's going to kick out. Don't want to run in a vacuum, but at the same time, I'm testing my pressure drop across my suction cores. So I have to test my pressure drop across the suction cores. I have to throw a gauge on the suction uh, header, and I have to throw a gauge on the uh, a probe on the uh, compressor. So I start to shut the valve on the compressor, and I see how low it's going to get and when it's going to cut out. And then when it stops, that way I know where it is. If I need to tweak it a little bit, I tweak it. If it's way off, I'm probably going to replace it. If it's an older control, if you pull it apart and it looks real rough inside, it's probably going to get replaced. Um Generally, I try to buy like high quality, like pen pen controls. Usually, I mean, they like everything. The quality's kind of gone down. What what's uh, my my? So this is a two part question. So my my favorite part of seeing racks wired up and Kaiser starting to do this more and more, where basically you have the the one you know the one pressure switch per suction group. So if you have two you know a medium and a low temp, you'll basically have two suction pressure controls, and then basically they cut. Um, all the power not going to the actual uh, relay, but the the set of contacts that actually um, that are that are on the relay, and that's that's my the, my favorite way to see them ran because you know the more pressure controls, the more potential leaks that you that you have. So if you can limit that, that's great. Um, my other question is to you. Um, so I do the timing a little bit differently. Um, if it's a digital compressor, I basically turn that uh, turn that time delay off um entirely like i'll turn it down to zero seconds um and i'm usually uh you know 30 seconds if it if it wasn't a digital compressor i'd go 30 seconds a minute 30 2 30 3 30 and so on um it depends it depends on the size if you have compound coolers and you do that things will be banging on and off like a banshee if, if you don't give them more time especially you getting some bigger compounds and it the rack doesn't catch up the rack the rack catches up with the load too fast. Okay. And I'm sure one of my kids just hit the alarm button on the car. Awesome. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I, I generally stage mine out a little more. I'd rather the rack kind of laggy, get laggy and uh, 
you know, take a little while longer than to start banging them on and off like crazy. How about your, um, uh, with the digital compressors? Cause you know, what I found out is, you know, if not they, long about the controller anyway, so I don't care about the digital compressor. No, but if you were, if you weren't to have it set at zero, right. And let's just say, you know, it loses, um, you know, something happens where it ends up, you know, uh, going off on low pressure, whatever have you, whatever reason you want to, you want to name, um, you know, I mean, would you agree having it, having it that low? Because I mean, otherwise you're going to have to go there and physically drop the power off no, of the IGCM module. If, it, if it's wired correctly, you won't have to, because it'll go off on that, uh, uh, de- not demand signal loss. It'll go off on, uh, the other, uh, was it like three or five? It'll go off on uh, a safety circuit. So as soon as the safety circuit makes back, it, it'll start back up. Well, then they're wiring it wrong from the factory. Yeah. Like on all these racks. You know what I mean? I, I, I wire mine where it breaks L1. When I do the, the, the uh, when I do the retrofits, I, I wire, I break it with the incoming power coming into it. Okay, and that, and that makes and that makes that sense. Will, That's the reason why. That was, if it does reset, then it, it you know it it kills the reset to the whole module. Sorry, well, I mean, are you going to do that on a brand new rack that you know that you know no. not not let's just say brand new, but you know one that's been in use for you know two or three years, and you find that this issue issue is is coming up? Are you going to set the timer to zero seconds, or are you gonna you gonna spend the time to rewire the whole thing? I'm going to flip two wires. Yeah. It literally, it, it's all it is. Okay. I mean, it it depends. I mean, generally, I don't see time to. If they have digital compressors, they usually don't have time delays. I mean, okay. Walmart and Sam's is a little different. I mean, obviously, they they have stringent things with that, but they aren't using. I mean, they they use very few Copeland discuses. Okay. So. But in, in general, like it's the controller's got to keep catch up with it anyway. So by the time everything comes back on, I mean it, the, the EMS is usually not booted up in that time anyway. So by the time a time delay makes, I mean you're usually golden. Gotcha. I, I I see very few issues with that. All right. Now the the same way that you talked about the um, the low pressure switch, as far as setting that, you know, versus what saturated you're running, um, you know. Y- you want to keep the compressor running within the operating specs. I know there there's some uh, some companies out there they preach that they want all their low pressure switches uh, on the MS to be set for like two and five, which isn't correct because you know if you think about it, you know you can have a medium temp compressor and you try to follow that rule, and now you're basically you know potentially opening up that compressor on internal. Uh, windings because you know that compressor wasn't made to operate at that low of a a suction pressure yeah it really it really depends on the compressor but at the same time like okay so chicago gets to minus 20 you have to make sure that that low pressure control is set low enough where say your say your lowest ambient is minus 20 okay you you may need to set that pressure control to minus 25 you need to be lower than the lowest ambient because it's not going to come back on. If if it's not set lower than the lowest ambient, it's not coming back on. So, all right, well, because I guess it would be like an ambient based, right? Because I mean, it, yeah, honestly, pretty, if you're part, talking, it, it for for control, it's pretty much solely ambient based. So even if you're doing, um, even if you're doing a rack um, in Chicago, you guys are 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 putting the pressure switch. Rack is rack is different. So a rack would be. A rack is going to be based on whatever saturation you're trying to maintain as a backup. Mm-hmm. So that, that's where you're going to set that. So like, but generally all, all these uh, customers have a setting. Like I said, I usually go like four or five degrees under what the, what the set point is. So if it's 18 degrees, I'll go like 14 or 12 and then I'll slowly step them up or I'll go like 10 and I'll step them up two degrees every time, depending on how many compressors I have. So if I go 10, I'll go 12. I'll go 14. I'll go 16. So I'll go up two in two degree increments. So that way, and then two, two degree down. So I'll make them tight. They're going to be super, super tight. Yeah. But, um, 
at the same time, like a rack is different than an operating control for a, a single unit. An operating control for a single unit, you have to set it lower than the lowest ambient you have because especially for Chicago, like it's not going to restart. And we learned that a couple of years ago with all the bullseye stores where they weren't set low enough. They were set like 10, 12 pounds, 13 pounds. We got to minus 30 one day and probably half the single units didn't restart after they shut off for defrost. And and I'm assuming they have like the warm, or I'm sorry, the cold ambient kits on them where basically yeah, they, I mean, they wrap talking, your, When it's they minus wrap, 30, go ahead. Where they wrap your receiver. I'm just, I'm explaining it because not, not everyone knows what that is. So a lot of, a lot of areas where it's cold, you know, they put additional stuff on there to, to prevent certain things from happening. So up in the Chicago area, they might, uh, wrap your receiver they might put heaters on the receiver once it you know that turns on once the ambient temperature hits you know 50 degrees or, or whatever have you um you know sometimes they put uh, those delays that you were talking about um where they basically bypass the low pressure switch um like on the qrc units the beacon systems you know basically they want you to the the mechanical controls bone once you set them for you know like to think two and ten and basically that that bypass is a delay on make so basically it's going to bypass until you know whatever the predetermined seconds is and then you know as soon as that predetermined seconds is done then it basically unbypasses the low pressure switch and the idea is that hey if we just let it pull down to vacuum just for a little teeny tiny bit um we'll be able to get it back up and, and restarted without having to you know do anything crazy I rip those out of every larger scroll unit because all they do is kill compressors. If, yeah. if it's non beacon, I rip that stuff right out. Yeah. I, ri- I rip out the low ambient bypass. I, I've, I've seen those things fail and kill. We, we had a warehouse where they killed like 13 compressors like that. Yeah. Well, unfortunately the only way that you can do it where it's not going to affect the, you know, it's almost like the IDCM module problem where like, if it doesn't get the, the, amperage you know pulling from the contactor it's you know it's basically going to say that you're that you're not you know starting that that compressor up so um i've seen already where they basically turn them into pump down systems where they what do they do oh they put a resistor um by itself on the compressor out um so basically whenever the compressor calls to be on it's automatically sensing that amperage so it's not like um you know, it's 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 going to simulate that the contactor is actually running and get away from those. Hey, you know, the compressor didn't come on when it was called upon. You know what I mean? So because those controls have to be set, you know, like tits on a bull. Otherwise, the, you know, they'll, you'll get a lot of fault errors with those. Yeah. Well, here, here's the other thing, too. Like if you guys are doing like a lot of 448 and 449, this has become a nightmare for us. Mm-hmm. Um, they got to be tight. Like it's it's like two and like five or two and eight to keep them from like banging on and off like one pound. Mm-hmm. I mean, you need uh, a nice, accurate digital probe. Analog gauges are not going to cut it, especially when you're getting down like as tight as these, somebody's got to go. We did a bunch of the bullseye uh, freezer rewor- reworks. Like a lot of the units are oversized, especially in the winter time. Mm-hmm. If you're not setting these with an accurate accurate digital gauge you're not getting anywhere near close and we, we found that out one of the other startup guys was doing them and he was using analog gauge and uh by the time we stepped them all down to like as low as they would go um during normal operation they were banging on and off and he was close i mean but like it wasn't close enough so i mean you got to remember when some of these condensing units are going to be oversized in the winter time yeah the suction's going to be in the tank I mean, it is what it is. I mean, it's just the way that everything's being sized and, you know, oversized for summer operation now and uh, for lower TDs. And you're going to have some lower suction pressure. So, like, when you're setting 448 um, low pressure controls, like, on, on brand new units, I'm pulling them off. And I am, after or after we pressure test them, I'm pulling them off and I'm hooking the nitrogen tank right to it. And I'm, and I'm setting it the way I set it because – it's almost impossible to set it while it's running like that. It, it is it is very difficult to try to set a low pressure control at two and five or two and eight. Like it's just it's just a pain in the ass. I mean, with nitrogen, it's a lot easier. So that that that's why I do it that way. And I've been like forcing my guys to do it that way. So that way you don't have these issues. Um, 
like I said, generally I try to use uh, the micro set like Johnson controls, like pen, uh, usually a higher end pressure control. I'll try to use those or the, the, the gray Dan Foss controls they actually work out pretty well. Um, they work out pretty good. Like they make a nice high pressure control. Um, make sure you guys are ordering ones with the, the correct alarm contacts. They have them. So just, just be aware of that stuff. Don't, I mean, try not to use encapsulated pressure controls if you can. I mean, you want some adjustment on there. Just so you guys know the Emerson ones where the they bolt in there and they have the three wire in there. You can adjust those at the bottom. The Emerson like uh, PSK, like encapsulated pressure controls, you can adjust those on the bottom of them. You pull it out and there's a little tiny metric Allen screw that goes in there and you can adjust that pressure control that way. It is a pain. So just be patient. So you could adjust just those that way. No, I know you said for, you know, you're, you know, low pressure, high pressure, whatever you're doing the nitrogen trick, which I'm in, I'm in total agreement with you. Um, when checking the actual pressure control to, you know, verify what you just did now, it should be a hundred percent accurate. But, um, when checking, especially like the high pressure controls, I've heard it either way where, you know, um, I will slowly close off the service valve in order to check my, my high pressure switch. Now, a lot of guys frown upon that, you know, because if you're not kind of playing a ginger with it, you know, they're, they're saying that it could potentially have damage. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? That's how I do it, but I get a little bit more risque with that. So, um, obviously time is money and, uh, I like to do things a little, little faster and try to do all of them at the same time. But I will, if I'm doing one exactly, uh, if I'm doing one pressure control and one compressor, I'm just replacing it to make sure it shuts off. I'm going to do what you said. I'm going to slowly shut down the discharge until it starts creeping up. Just just watch your gauge. Don't be stupid about it. And don't take the M12 ratchet to it. Like, you know, some of the videos I've made where guys have freaked out about, like, and don't just slam it down shut. You're going to blow a head gasket. I mean, at the very least. Just to slowly bring it down. You'll get to like, you'll get to where it'll start hissing. You'll see the pressure start going up, and then you could slowly let it hit, and you'll kick off on high pressure. Now, say I'm doing a rack PM. Now I'm more experienced, and for the most part, I paid attention to what I'm doing. Uh, don't laugh at me. Are you laughing at me? No. <laughs> no. All right, so what I will do is I will, I will throw a gauge on there and I will override the EMS set point so the EMS doesn't kick out the uh, the discharge pressure. I'll override it. I will throw a gauge on there and I will start to close the main discharge ball valve. And I will start to throttle down the main discharge ball valve until I get to that set point. Now, I should kick out every single compressor at the same time. And it now watch your gauge because if you start creeping up, so say my set point kick out is 350. Okay. First one out of 350 keeps going 355. Like, you know, one gets to 360. Okay. Whatever. If it's, you know, then another one at 350. If I start seeing a creep up 370, 380, okay, I'm going to back off. Obviously, there's something wrong with that one compressor. Now I'll test that one compressor individually. I know the other ones are good. And say it's not calling for that compressor, the discharge should still be should still be high enough for it to kick it kick out the low pressure the high pressure control. So that compressor won't run until you reset it. So you could just check it with your meter and check it. So instead of sitting there taking the caps off every compressor, you know, check everything and all that stuff. Now all I need to do is reset them all and i know all the uh, high pressures are good so that that's how i do them on a, on a rack pm i mean it's a little more risky but at the end of the day like okay if i'm doing eight compressors and you got to do them your way that's going to take okay say eight to ten minutes a compressor um by the time you take everything off then you got to re-leak check everything because you could have left the leak um i could do mine in you know five minutes Hey guys, today's episode is sponsored by Westermeyer Industries Serviceable Oil Floats. Many oil separators contain an oil float to effectively meter separated oil back to the compressors. 
Westermeyer Industries has taken this concept and perfected it with their new line of serviceable oil floats. These floats feature an improved design with fewer components, allowing for greater manufacturer consistency and up to 20% increased oil flow versus their legacy models. These floats also feature an integrated magnet to shield the oil path from debris and have been field proven in supermarket applications. Westmeyer Industries offer replacement oil floats not only for their own separators, but also cross compatible models for our competitor oil separators as well. You can find out more about the Westermeyer Industries serviceable oil floats by visiting westermeyerind.com backslash floats. Once again, that's westermeyerind.com slash float. Let's get on with the episode. And I've checked every compressor on the rack. Is there any other, I'm, I'm trying to think of any other, <laughs> like, I was thinking of any other pressure controls that we could, you know, talk about. Um, I mean, because there really isn't that many that we use, right? I mean, um, I don't know if you've ever had the the want or desire or need to work on a uh, Kramer thermal bank. You work on many of those? We, we had like a couple. Um you know, one thing I want to go over real quick that uh, gets missed a lot, um, the differential pressure switch for the uh, coalescent oil separators. Gotcha. So on the, a lot of these, Westermeyer makes them, Tempride makes them. Um, I've seen some random manufacturers make them where they make a differential gauge. Uh, not the best. I mean, Westermeyer makes that, that, that true differential transducer gauge. That thing's great works a thousand times better than the, the uh, original switch. So what, what they're doing with this switch is basically it is a differential pressure switch. So it has uh, two, it has a in and out coming on there. So you have a separator inlet, separator outlet. So this pressure switch is a differential pressure switch. When it starts seeing a differential pressure between the separator, it's going to start rising and showing a difference. It's going to let the pressure bleed through. Now, once it gets up and hits, when the, before the filter bl blows through, you hit that 13 pounds and it'll hit and then it'll allow that, you know, gauge to read that alarm point. There's an alarm uh, closure inside there. So when it gets to like, say, 13 pounds is generally what it's at. There's an alarm closure in there. OK, then it closes the contacts in the controller. So this could be do, this could be done two ways. I just seen zero zone done, do this at Costco. They wire to a relay. So basically it energizes a relay and then that relay is a latching circuit so that relay uses a latching circuit so once it's energized a contact of that relay goes through a push button switch and then back to hold the relay closed so basically anytime that differential pressure switch makes you have to physically go there and push the button to reset the differential alarm because here's the problem with these they blow the filter gasket the differential pressure switcher switch goes back to zero. Now there's no pressure difference across the switch. So that differential pressure switch has no, has no pressure drop on there. So it's zero. So everybody thinks it's good. Everybody thinks it's great. It's not, it blew the filter. You didn't see it. Okay. So they're using a latching circuit. They're using that to energize a coil. Then the co uh, one leg of the coil through, re through the relay is holding the coil closed. So then you have to push the button in. When you push the momentary switch button in, it breaks the power going from the relay to the coil and then resets the relay. It's called a latching circuit. Now, that is one way to do it. How I do it is I make a sensor control. I bring it right to the board, to the EMS, okay? I bring it right to my input board. I make a sensor control. I'll program a sensor control. So when it hit, as soon as it hits, it stays on for 45 minutes to a half hour. That way it's an alarm and that way the logging catches it. So it doesn't have to be a latching circuit, but it's going to show up in the alarm, in the alarm uh, queue. And then it's going to be um, in the log for half an hour to an hour, depending on how it is. So what I do is I, I make it so when it's on, it's commanded on. And then the time delay for it to go back off in the sensor control 
is an hour or a half hour. So that way the logging catches it and you don't have to worry about it. So a lot of these are set up wrong and they're just set up as normal logging. And if a log group's three minutes, it may not catch it below the filter. So we started doing this at a storage chain and we, we started seeing filters before, blow, you know, blown a lot faster than we were seeing, you know, than we're finding them on service. So we were catching actual filter alarms instead of not catching any filter alarms. Uh, the latching circuit's a really good way. I mean, that's, that takes a lot more effort than it does to just make some uh, sensor controls and move it around, but that's a differential pressure switch. Now, the other type of differential pressure switch we use is on, like, say, a glycol skid. So we're using a glycol skid for, uh, you know, for moving our glycol around. We have a differential pressure switch on our supply to return. So what this switch does is when the pump is running, we should have a pressure difference from supply to return. If the pump does not see that, or if the controller does not see that differential pressure switch close in a uh, when the pump is running, it knows there's no difference. So it means there's no flow. So that could mean you're deadheading the pump. You have no fluid left in the system. You ran out. Uh, you lost your charge. So this is why uh, a differential pressure switch is used in that application. You'll see them at just about every glycol rack I've ever seen has a differential pressure switch on there for the uh, the pump differential. And it could be mechanically set up where it breaks power with a time delay, or it could be on the EMS where it's an input to the EMS to say, hey, the pump is running, um, give it a 10 second you know, window as you see a differential. If it doesn't see a differential, it's gonna kick that pump off, it's gonna start pump two. Okay, if it doesn't see a differential, okay, it's gonna kick that pump off and lock out. Now we're gonna lock out the, the glycol pumps for differential. Uh, we do this a lot for like chillers, same thing. You could use differential pressure switches for uh, proof of chillers, you know, flow, proof of flow. Yeah, anything to add, Brett? Yeah, um, we were, you know, you were talking about different ways to do sensor controls as far as the, the oil, the oil differential. Cause I mean, I'll be honest with you. I don't think other than the, the sensor, you know, or the input going bad, you know, locking out one way or another. I don't think that I physically have ever caught one where, you know, it basically opened up. So could we do, I mean, we could, but I mean, would this be feasible where you would basically make two sensor controls using the same input and, you know, basically you have a, uh, or function, uh, one is set up as a momentary switch, uh, and the other one set up as a regular conventional, uh, switch. So if you do have that quick flicker, um, you know, it, it's basically going to tell your, your, um, your switch that you did have a state change, you know what I mean? And then, you know, be able to, to log it that way. So now you have one that's, that's looking for a, a change in state, a momentary change in state. And then the other one where you're basically looking to see if it'll hold an on or an off. Yeah, you could do that. I mean, that's not a big deal. Um, generally when I, when I make the just the normal sensor control and I drop the the update rate in the sensor control from 20 seconds down to two seconds, mm -hmm. I, I've yet to see one with a blown filter not register for the most part. Okay, I just like you I, know, said, I never looked at I never looked into the program. I thought it was just a regular. I mean, usually they're just a conventional uh, uh, a sensor control. Nothing special about it. You know what I mean? That's the problem. Like, so like the OEMs, when they did all the programming in a lot of these stores, like they didn't, nobody thought this through. Like they thought it was going to show a differential. I've never come up to one and be like, oh, it's at eight or 10 pounds. It says it right there. I've never seen one move ever. I, it's like a little magic elf that moves in the middle of the night. I, I've seen it only like if you were to have, you know, let's just say two compressors running and then all of a sudden something comes out of defrost and it might go from, you know, three, uh, you know, one or two pounds of differential up to like you know four or five but it was just momentary because of the the hot load coming back uh you know from the from the rack and then basically it was you know you didn't see the differential at this amount of discharge cfm but you saw it when you know your you know third biggest compressor finally came on you know what i mean i will say with the diff with the westermeyer transistor ones uh with having the analog input to the controller we were able to drag it and graph it like i have graphs of one slowly getting up higher like you got up to like five five six pounds i change it then like i, I i'm not messing around with a 13 pound filter drop i'm just going to change it if it has a couple pound drop on it 
if it's loading up. So we actually, we actually linearly set up a graph where it's actually graphing the sensor and following it. So, you know, we can catch it before it happens. I mean, before it blows out in the middle of the night and then it's a huge overtime cost and a guy that's probably not going to have a filter because let's be honest here, um, nobody has anything in stock anymore. So um, they may not even have a filter. So uh, that's, that's one benefit of that. But the other way to test those, just so you guys know, um, the way I do it is I will shut off the outlet uh, valve. So the outlet of the oil separator, I will shut off that valve, that packed angle valve. You, I hope it's on there. I had no EM this time to stab it in there with copper, no shut offs. And that was, that was real cool. Um, so shut off the outlet valve, crack it, let it bleed down a little bit to where you show a differential, get it close to like 13 pounds. It'll, it'll bleed down and hold. And then once it's down to 13 pounds, make sure you have that closure, you know, and that sensor control is actually functioning properly. That's how I generally handle it. If you do not get that closure, I mean, just bleed it out a little more to get the max and leave it at where it's maxed out. And if it's still not getting that closure, you have a bad switch. I mean, I've had a couple come out bad. The first, uh, uh Westermeyer uh you know the the Delta P monitor that they make the reef shield um the first one I ever installed um you know you basically have to put in your range there and at first I thought I messed up the program because it wasn't showing anything I was like what did I do I messed something up and then you know long story short I'm looking around I then notice that there's a gallon of oil you know sitting there you know almost drained all the way all the way out and I see a history of oil failures and that's when I then realized I'm like, oh, wait, this has been failing for a long time. You know, I should have caught, you know, the one or two pound differential that you're typically going to catch with those. But because this one, you know, already blew out the you know oil separator, I just I installed it under false pretenses. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's just it's just generally checking your stuff just up. Uh, you know, looking over it. I mean, I, I, I have just about almost every startup either that's wired wrong or it's in backwards or, I mean, that, that thing gets uh, the, the, the differential switch gets messed up, messed up all the time. So just like check them out. I don't know how many racks I found that are like eight, 10 years old. That it was never even programmed in. How many, how many, um, uh, the CO2 racks that you, that you guys are doing with all the transcritical, um, is there is there anything different or special that you want to talk about that you might have to do with those type of racks versus a regular conventional? No, I mean generally we don't really have low pressure controls. I mean some of the Aldis do on the low temp will have low pressure controls, and then uh, we'll have standard high pressure controls on the on the low temp uh, discharge, but the medium temp is going to be all computer controlled. No, no, uh, no high pressure controls. No low pressure controls. The gotcha. oh, sorry, take it back. We will have high pressure controls, but they are uh, usually Emerson, uh, the Emerson Black uh, encapsulated, PS yeah, P yeah, encapsulated PSK ones, and the uh, Bitzer has their own ones they use all the time. So we so, will have those high pressure, but they're all encapsulated. I don't know if the Bitzer ones are the same thing as uh, as the other ones you were the Emerson ones, but um, you know those typically uh, they have like a looks almost like a transducer block on the top where you know basically has uh four four would be four prongs but they're over you only using three yeah yeah okay. that's the one so, so on, on those ones uh, just be mindful guys like uh, you know a couple times i thought i had an open switch and there are you have to loosen up the the packing nut that holds the wire in um but if you loosen it up um right at the top once you pull the one uh the assembly that actually plugs into the to the transducer itself uh versus the other portion um there's three flathead screws on there that actually hold the wires down usually they're tinned uh be mindful because i've seen them on you know compressors that have been running for a minute um they end up vibrating themselves free so if you have an intermittent low or high pressure uh switch you know that's basically giving you shit um make sure you look into that you might that might you might find something there yeah i mean that that's a big one um the other thing with those make sure you uh if it's loose at all go get longer screws i don't know how many of them i found that came out with like the screws too short and they like they don't they don't see properly like you can screw a, a screw in there that's like another quarter inch to three eighths longer and it's fine and it, and it holds a lot better so yeah, if you have a like center assembly like where you actually like where it would be like the solenoid coil stamp or whatever the, the screws are too short 
okay. on all on all those black PSKs. Yeah. I, I generally on all my startups, I take a screws out and I get longer ones. Gotcha. I had way too many of them pop off. Then and it, it's a pain in the ass. Like they they they. It, it, it's like they 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 break the threads out because it like barely grabs anything. Um, good pressure control. It's just uh, kind of a pain with that, and like everything's in bars, so even their like smaller stuff. So you got to do a lot of converting. Uh, one more thing I did want to I did want to bring up. Um, since we are talking about pressure controls, and and this is something that you should be highly aware of. Make sure so all the pressure controls that I had in my truck um, always did not have a capillary tube. And the only reason why I didn't is, you know, it's for me, um, I feel they're, they're more likely of a potential leak. Um, Cause basically you have, you know, this small wound of copper that, you know, let's just say it was on a single system. You installed it. Uh, someone installed the condenser fan motor a couple weeks later. And then all of a sudden now you have a leak on the pressure control tubes because uh, no one ever, uh, you know, uh, caulked them up or, you know, put, uh, insulation tape you know to keep everything separate um so i mean i always put you know the regular you know hoses on there but be mindful because not every single hose is made equally um you have the richy yellow ones that have to be on a suction because they they cannot take the high temperature um same thing with the black uh black richy ones um there is a temperature range on there and whenever i see them installed on the high pressure side especially if that thing is low temp um I've seen where the, you know, basically the, you know, the rubber starts melting away from the actual housing and then, you know, starts, starts letting go. So, you know, be mindful. Um, if I have my, my way, I usually install the Johnson controlled armored hoses that are for the capillary tube. Um, it does have a regular standard capillary tube in there, but it's covered with the braided hose. So you have that all the way for me. What's that? I, I, I only want the ultra tubes. See, I so the reason why they they do that, um, and also be mindful of this. You do have a piece that you can break off to make it on mm-hmm. on some of them, not every single one, where um, you can break off the tip on the inside and basically makes it Schrader or not Schrader. Um, you can break that full center piece out, but the, I mean the reason why they have that in there is to prevent um, from like any kind of pulsation. That's the whole reason yeah. why they put those capillary tubes in there. Same thing with the. Um, you ever seen the old baby blue uh, Husman racks where they have that uh, lo- uh, looks like a snubber. zucchini? Yeah, it's like a little snubber. Yeah, so basically, you know, what's it, inch and three, inch and five or whatever. And, you know, the reason why, you know, it has all their, their fan cycling switches connected to that. So, like, it, it, it prevents pulsation from, you know, from any kind of rogue pressure you might be getting from somewhere. Um, but like I said, just be mindful when you are selecting – um a hose if you go that route um always break out those schrader depressors always do not yes. forget to do that because they will block a hole i've seen it where they've blocked holes on high pressure controls and mm-hmm. cause disasters also if you're since we are also talking about high pressure controls um you want to like if you have a high pressure uh control on your compressor you always want to have an access fitting right there because just because it's going off on high pressure right there um, but it's not on your EMS or anything like that. You could be potentially kicking yourself in the in the in the teeth and not finding the actual issue. Um, you know, I, I've heard of compressors. Uh, you know, some of the Copeland ones they have a uh, it's a they call I think they call it a muffler. Basically, it's a it's a plate in there that has a whole bunch of holes in it. And depending on how big um, the compressor is, the more holes it has. Well, it, there was a rack that. Um, had a bunch of four D's on there and it had, you know, maybe four or five holes rather than the eight that it was originally supposed to have. And this went on for months um, because no one could ever find that it was actually going off on high pressure. We'll come to find out that the, um, you know, it didn't have enough holes, you know, going through there. So you actually had a pressure drop um, across the, uh, across the service valve, but without knowing, you know, what your actual, you know, discharge pressure is by either having a T or whatever, um, you would never find out. So, you know, make sure wherever you're checking, you are actually getting a true blue discharge reading because it might throw off your diagnostic. Yeah. Well, guys, uh, thanks for listening. I think it's going to be all on pressure controls. So um, thanks for listening and uh, we'll catch you in the next one. Have a good night, guys.
I need your help. I can't tell you what it is. You can never ask me about it later, and we're gonna hurt some people. Whose car are we gonna take? 